Ну, ничего страшного. Я уйду все равно сейчас. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Arsene Tikharitonov. I will be this improvised uh, tech support for Professor Bushkova. I, I will only, uh, since this is the first time we are doing this, I'm going to just a little bit set up uh, the desktop for Julia and we'll let you be. Julia, is it fine? Or can you read? I think so. Yes, I can read. Uh, please uh, write in the chat that you can hear and see clearly that everything is is works fine. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Again, would you please somebody write in the chat um, that you can actually hear me? Because I'm not sure if... Okay, good. Somebody hears me. That means everybody hears me. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, I'm very glad that you're here. <laughs> and I will try to do my best to get around all this here. My uh, setup for this stream, which is, yes... Um, this is the first one I've ever done, so hope everything will go well in terms of technicalities. Okay, so I think I will start with um, answering some questions that everybody um, came in. Um, and those questions were in the community and um, other in the comment sections. So somebody asked me, uh, somebody who is working on the Bach's cello suites, which are transcribed for violin. This is a recent, um, sorry, will this live stream will, will be saved? Yes, it will be saved and it will hopefully be uh, visible to everybody later on. Okay, so Bach's cello suites transcribed for violin solo. Uh, this is a relatively recent developments, I believe, uh, in, in terms of transcribing cello suites for violin. Um, and I have not done them on violin, but the question was, um, I often find my left hand is challenging in awkward positions. How do I maintain a relaxed left hand while, when playing these passages? As we know, in Bach, uh, lots of times things are awkward on violin, period, whether it's transcribed from cello or was just written for violin, they're going to be awkward. Okay, so maintaining relaxed left hand pretty much means that you should be letting go of tension in between difficult things because not everything is difficult. Just like awkward position, you concentrate on that, you focus on that, you place your fingers there, and then immediately after that, you let go and the hand has to let go, which sometimes we forget about this. So basically, this is how we do it. It's on and off in terms of um, effort, muscular effort, and, and somewhat relaxation. Again, when you're playing, you're not totally relaxed anyway. Just remember that there's no such thing as total relaxation when you play. But there should be full functional relaxation. So when something is not working, in other words, then... Um, it should be, so if I'm working, I'm working. The moment I'm not working or I'm not, I work with these fingers, but not with these ones, these ones are resting. You know, it can, it, it's an easy example, but it will be the same thing in difficult examples in Bach. Yep, absolutely same mechanics. Um, second part of the question, uh, when uh, I compare a Rachel Podger's recording of the transcribed cello suites and, uh, versus cello suites versus cellists, I find many places where almost all the cellists play the notes separately with a bouncing bow while Padre plays more legato. Uh, my teachers also suggested legato for these places. Is this more of a personal taste? 
uh, difference or a violin versus cello difference. I would imagine um, that it is much more of interpretational issue and it has not nothing to do with cello or violin. But yes, interpretationally, uh, you choose to do it one way or the other way. Most, um, well, again, I have not played them. I've seen Rachel Podger play. And for instance, in the first suite, when she just starts, that she actually does the opposite. She plays it in a faster tempo that most cellists do, as far as I saw a little bit. Um, and she, therefore, comes off the string when many cellists don't. You know, so and what the uh, question asker refers to in terms of which specific places where cellists play off the string and she plays on string. Again, if you want to play more uh, Baroque, uh, true to Baroque, I would imagine that Rachel Padger makes perfect sense in, in anything that she would do, by the way. Let's go to the next question. Um, what are some good ways to maintain technique when recovering from injury? Um, and what are some long-term strategies to avoid injury in order to continue playing? Okay, this is, uh, these are very broad questions. Uh, main thing I probably would say that would pertain to all of that, um, maintain technique when recovering from injury. Mm, depends on what injury you, you have. For instance, if one has an injury to right shoulder, um, then you cannot really, well, you cannot maintain your right hand technique while you're recovering from this injury, because if you cannot raise your arm, since the shoulder is involved raising your arm, you won't be able to raise your arm. So your right hand will be resting really and um, working on healing while left hand you still can do without playing with the right hand. Yes, you can do silent practice basically on the left hand. You can analyze, you can listen to the music, you can uh, learn pieces in your mind um, uh, by sight singing and thinking them through and repeating the solfege notes if you use solfege. You can do a lot of things, but you just will exclude the right hand. Now, if you are already functional, for instance, again, if that's, let's say, this joint, you probably won't be able to play on G-string for a while, but you will be able to play on E sooner. So you can then um, play exercises, scales in different patterns um, and parts of pieces, arpeggio, uh, parts of pieces that you can find that are on E-string only uh, on E-string. So that would be a good thing, maintaining already the motion Okay, so that is uh, how you recover. That's injury specific. So I will have to know exactly what injury it is and then suggest something specific. I don't really like answering questions too generally. It's not helpful. So long-term strategies to avoid injury to, in order to continue playing. That's a good one. Um, and so the first thing to avoid injury is to warm up sufficiently. And I uh, did... Um, a video on, on that just recently, it came out, uh, the full warm up, And then of course, another video, as I mentioned there, the corner stretch and just maintaining good posture, which is really important. So um, those things are preventatives. Uh, while playing, it's very important not to repeat anything strenuous. Like for instance, if you're working on uh, stretches, like big stretches, like uh, tense, Right, so when you go to the tense position and you're in this in this situation and you're working on those tense here and there, never work on anything strenuous for more than, I would say, two minutes at a time, and then you take a break. Uh, sometimes if it's really difficult physically, like for instance, learning, uh, learning um, finger doctors, when you play an octave with one, three, and uh, four, two, um, those things, I would even say, First, start with half a minute, then you build up to a minute, then you build up to maybe a minute and a half, two minutes. But again, practice-wise, I would not ever exceed five minutes once you're well-conditioned uh, for something really strenuous. So this important thing, don't repeat the same passages uh, many times, again, for many minutes, because if you use the same muscles, they will not like it. 
and that's when how you will get basically injured. Uh, and of course, the over underlying tension will lead to this. So tension is a bad thing. So let's see, next one. Um, how to gain better control of vibrato, width, speed, etc. And any recommendations for exercises or drills? Uh, hello, everybody. I just see new people joining in. Um, okay, so better control of vibrato. The best thing, of course, is to use this wonderful device called the metronome and um, also do... Okay, so let's go to the width and speed. All right, so the width of vibrato, if done correctly. Now, I will be speaking primarily of the wrist vibrato, right? So that we're all on one page because there are lots of confusion with terminologies in, in violin and or any other instruments. Terminology is key to understand what I mean by this term or that term. So here we have with vibrato. Do your string crossing. Hmm. Anyway, so um, with vibrato, what we mean by vibrato. So I recommend to do what I call wrist vibrato, which is this motion. Okay, we call it wrist vibrato when in fact it's kind of hand vibrato, you should also can call it, right? Because wrist itself doesn't move, but wrist uh, is a joint from which this motion generally originates, put it this way. Is the arm or armed muscle in muscles involved in the wrist vibrato? Of course, they're still involved, but they're very secondary. So uh, th this what is called wrist vibrato, okay? Now this what would be called arm vibrato when you see it traditionally, not the whole arm, it's just the forearm, it's, it's this moment. And again, is something in the, in the upper arm involved when you do either wrist, so-called wrist or so-called arm? Sure. Everything is involved. In fact, your back muscles are even involved, but we're not going to use them in naming. Okay, so, and then um, the width of vibrato will really depend on your speed if you're doing it properly. So if my vibrato is slower, my width can be a lot bit, uh, wider, uh, the width is more. And when I do it faster, the width is much more narrow, okay? So this is correlation of the width and speed, of course, just like it will be with the bow in some ways. Uh, so uh, how to gain better control? Like in my experience, I, first of all, do not recommend to try to speed up vibrato that is on vibrato because it only would lead to tension. Yes, you can speed it up by making everything just basically like this tense. You see, so this is this is a really fast arm vibrato because I basically tense up the whole thing and it shakes, you know. And then this kind of vibrato is tiring. And also on stage when you're also on adrenaline, it's going to be really fast to the point that it will not be audible in the whole. So arm vibrato, speeding up arm vibrato, I do not recommend. I recommend learning the wrist vibrato. It's personally my personal favorite because you can do much more with that. So now if you have wrist vibrato, uh, then you do the um, pulsating movement like. After you already know the motion itself. Here, if you do third position, you should touch the violin. This is like wow, wow, two of them, right? Some people recommend to do just one. In this case, since I'm a third position, I will go downward because it's easier than going upward. Now, there's a lot of talk about uh, going under the page, over the page, and all of that. I will not go into this right now. I do have a very strong position in that. But uh, here, if you're in third position, the only comfortable way to do it is to go down. If you're in this position, you can do go both ways, up and down, or down and back. G sharp, okay. And so forth, okay. So, um, then you do one, and then you do two. Then you can do other pulsations 
on this. I probably should make a video on it. Actually, it's a good point. Um, but uh, other than that, I usually do it just with a metronome and then you put it in the metronome and you accelerate it with a metronome. Metronome is your best friend with vibrato. That's all I can tell you. Uh, next, um, tips on finding the right shoulder rest and chin rest combination. Okay, here, unfortunately, I cannot, um, I cannot really answer this question. The tip is the only one. It should be a comfortable combination for you. And as we are all different, we are different in so many ways in the shape of our jaws and, and just even when the jaw looks the same, it may feel different to other to different people. Uh, shape of our collarbones and our shoulders and how our shoulders slope and what kind of padding we have here. All kinds of differences and all these combinations. So there are really no general rules that I can give you. Oh, use this shoulder rest with this chin rest. Unfortunately, no. Like I've uh, found my combination is the uh, side chin rest. Uh, and I have it kind of really curved here. And because that's what fits my jaw and it goes kind of behind my jaw a little bit. And then mine, my shoulder rest is the um, narrow wolf, you know, this one, the, this shape, shape wolf. Okay. And so then it also is curved in a certain way, you see, to like this, it's to fit exactly my body because I have a prominent collarbone that goes here. Okay, so that's comfortable for me. But it's not to say that it'll be comfortable for everybody. Now, for many of my students, for when they are looking for to switch, um, it it is comfortable enough, and then it's very easy to fix because they just have to basically get an outfit I have. But to many of my students, it's not comfortable at all. So we'll have to look. Uh, what's comfortable for them. For some, the chin rest has to be absolutely flat. Some uh, can uh, have the uh, chin rest in the middle of the violin, which is positioned over um, the tailpiece. And I, I cannot do this. Uh, my violin slides if I put, put it in there. So what you want to avoid, you want to avoid any cradling like this, that, you know, instinctive uh, movement. For instance, if it weren't comfortable for me, I would do this and then and then cradle. So in other words, uh, this is comfortable. You can see my shoulder stays well, but if it weren't, I would do this. So that's an adjustment motion. If you notice that you have to do it in order for your violin to kind of be comfortable, uh, that means that you need to look at the combination. It's a combination, chin rest, shoulder rest. Um, I would first look at the chin rest and then at the shoulder rest, honestly, between us. <laughs> between all of us. Okay. Um, another thing also to remember that no one should really hold violin like this. We were taught that way. I was taught this way that, okay, that's how we hold violin and we should be able to move around. And it's all false. No, we shouldn't be holding violin with the neck only. We should hold violin in three portions. It's yes, with the weight of your head, basically, and on the collarbone or on your shoulder, whichever way you feel it, the violin should touch the collarbone here. Yeah, it should touch it there. So if you have a very a tall shoulder rest and your the violin doesn't touch it, reverse it. Make a taller uh, chin rest and a shorter shoulder rest. It's much more ergonomically, it's much better. Um, okay, so you your violin has to touch your body here on, on the collarbone. And then the other one um, is your hand. Yeah, your hand helps to support the weight. So far as right now, I'm just doing it with completely with my hand and not involving my shoulder at all. And that should be one of the ways also you um, you know, when you're uh, playing actually. Okay, let me see. I am, what shoulder rest is that? Uh, it's a Wolf Forte Secondo. Wolf Forte Secondo. It says there for uh, uh, less broad or more narrow shoulders. As you can see, I don't have narrow shoulders and it fits me very well. It actually fits most people better than full 
Wolf um, Primo. Okay, it's also completely adjustable version. Okay, so there's some uh, versions that are not adjustable here. You know, this one is fully adjustable, so I can pull out the legs uh, up, out, or in. So therefore, my and of course bend the the body of it. So um, so when I put this on, let's see here. Let me get rid of my bow. For that. Okay, so when I put it on here, I can put the, well, I know where mine is comfortable, right? So I will put it where it is. But let's say, you see, it is, I don't know how you can see it better. So it's slanted, for me, it's slanted like this. Again, is it for everybody? No, for somebody, it would might be completely even here. Then you will need to pull the legs out a little bit. So mine will not go completely even here, it just is too, too much together so for some people that should be the opposite will be even maybe the opposite like this very close to this oops of course it won't want to um hold there right now because it's not uh, narrow enough but anyway it's a completely adjustable fully adjustable one and i usually get rid of this you see this portion right that i usually uh we, we cut it off we saw it off once i find my shape and uh, so that it doesn't poke into the violin, varnish later on into the back of the violin. Um, again, it was very helpful to me to learn to play without shoulder rest at all, but for that I have a video with or without shoulder rest. Um, okay, let me see if I can see some of your questions in here. Left in articulation, all right, so... Um, let me do this. I will go first from the questions that were pre-submitted uh, and then to the chat. Okay, so other pre-submitted question. Uh, sizing up instrument for beginners of all ages. How do you go about sizing it? When do you change to a bigger instrument? And what do you need to take into consideration? Uh, you know, honestly, I don't teach little kids too much, uh, too often at all. I rarely, very rarely teach them. But the general, so there will be, in other words, there will be some people online, you can find them, I'm sure, who just deal with little kids. Uh, like, look for Mimi Zweig in Indiana uh, University. Uh, she must have something on it with more detail. All I can tell you in general that we all know is that we, uh, you see how my arm is in relation when I hold the, um, the head of the violin, right? So my arm is still in this position. Of course, I have rather long arms for female. So here we go. So I could go up to this and it still would be a good size for me. So in other words, I could play viola quite fine. So, but however, if, if you're, if you're, it's a child and if it goes like this here, almost straight, it's way too big. So it's better to err on a smaller side than on a big side. That's what, that I can definitely tell you for a while and to let them grow. So when it becomes too bent like this, that means go to the next side. So we'll be here again in the first position. When it goes again too much like this, you go to the next side and the size and so forth. The same thing is about the bow. Uh, don't go to a bigger bow. It's the better stay with a smaller bow. If you err, err on a smaller size rather than a larger size, in my opinion, because it saves from having all these kind of problems of tension and lifting the weight that is too too heavy. If you when you do change on the bow, new bow, uh, it's advisable to not hold uh, the thumb like where I hold it but actually to start holding it on the thumb grip so in other words you're further away from the frog or sometimes even here so that the child can or or beginner adult by the way if the this uh, pinky is not developed well enough and it wants to do all kinds of you know bad things like being straight or poorly maintained uh, the posture of that uh, so it's better to be higher on on the bow where there, there's less weight, feel, feeling of less weight, just like basically what they do in a um, baroque, with the baroque bows. They hold far away from the frog. Okay. Um, 
What about pads and shoulder rests for small, super small students, five years of age? Again, I already said I don't teach this kind of age, but with children and sometimes even with adults, I would say always go with a smaller support rather than a bigger support. If five years old, definitely never shoulder rest. That I can tell you for sure. Five, six, seven years old, never shoulder rest. Go with a shoulder pad. There are lots of them. Uh, foam. Foam is good and just you have to try. You have to see how it fits the child, where it should fit, how you will slide it on this part and you know the, you will secure it with um, uh, with um, elastic bands. Thank you. Okay, um, let's go to the chat questions now. Okay, demonstrate beginner violin arpeggios and scales, please. Um, that is a bit, um, again, a little bit general question. Uh, do you mean the scales in one position? Beginner scales will be in one position. Um, the uh, I do have a video recently that they put when I demonstrate everything for two positions when you don't shift, which is also beginner. It's not the beginner, like first weeks, but it is a beginner. So I do have that video, please watch that one. Um, and arpeggios, I am going to actually post it. It's coming up. Again, it will be in the first position arpeggios, which is beginner, okay? So I think I will uh, skip that question for now, if you don't mind. Um, let's see. Please, how do you trail over string crossings, viola? This is when it is not possible to use instrument. You know, I'm so sorry, but I do not think I understand the question. Therefore, I can't answer it. Um, what would you say virtual the rest is the best? I think I already answered that one. Uh, even playing without shoulder rest is right, it's a torture. Okay, so if that's the case, so again, uh, if, if you tried a lot, it's a, it's your, probably your chin rest that may, might be the problem. So you need to experiment with different chin rests and then unfortunately go through different shoulder rests. So basically, um, for more people that I find, the sh uh, side chin rests usually work overall in my practice, only in my experience and overall, side chin rests work better. Work better. Of some, of course, it will be center chairs. But basically, what you want to do is to find the one that you feel like, okay, it's comfortable to, to rest here. Everything feels good. By the way, mine, if you can see here, you see how it slopes right there? It's been adjusted by a luthier. So when it was purchased, it was actually more even. So then I feel like, oh, it digs into my bone here, uh, okay, my jawbone, and luthier has shaved it down. And now it's comfortable. So that is also, keep in mind, it's possible if you feel something is un uncomfortable here. So sec second one, so here I am. I This is good. I touch, the violin touches here on the collarbone. I feel that, and this is the space that I need to fill. This is the space, so without doing this, the shoulder. Right? So I need to fill the space. I can put my hand there, violin droops down, which by the way is perfectly okay. Don't ever go that, oh, violin has to go up. Like what, like with high fits or somebody else, people usually say, "Oh, but it's just to go up." Not at all. If you are in doubt, look at uh, Leonidas Cavacos right now, one of the greatest living violinists, and his violin is always down. And not only him; there are many people whose violins are slightly down, and it's perfectly fine. It doesn't have to be up. So, but what you basically want to feel is this uh, space in here. So you can start with a foam uh, pad. And their uh, pads are called. Anyway, I will. I think I will just have to investigate the names of them and put them somewhere in, uh, or make a video about this more about the pads, specific names of them. But I do think I actually mentioned them in one of my videos in the in the setup video on a left hand setup video. I'm pretty sure I'm mentioning some of those. So, but just gen generic phone uh, foam pads. And then uh, seeing what might work. If you feel like, okay, it's just not enough support, 
uh, first go with raising your the height of your chin rest, which you feel is comfortable, okay? And then go again different uh, to different uh, shoulder rests. Okay, that would be my suggestion. Um, to improve left hand articulation. Uh, left hand articulation is the speed with which you take fingers off. Okay, so that's the one that, uh, that is important. Of course, it is important that we do press with the finger enough, but you know, most uh, like in, to make a clearer sound, but you see that is the speed of how I take the finger off rather than See, this is a slow taking off, and this is a fast one. You know, so it's much more energetic, it's instantaneous, and that's how I would say uh, that's the main thing to look for when you uh, address the articulation. Um, no chin rest works for you, somebody says, that's good for you, but you know, they just be careful that you don't damage the varnish of the violin, because um, we, we sweat and it, it eats up the varnish. So you probably should put some cloth onto that violin. Um, uh, so if your curved bone musica is, uh, uh, slides off, there could be two reasons. One, the bone musica is the shoulder, as somebody's asking, uh, curved bone musica slides off or you lose it while playing. It could be two reasons. While one, it's a little bit too kind of loose, truly, or another one, also a very common one, people don't think about this, is that you have a lot of pressure that you actually unconsciously press up with your shoulder and it squeezes that uh, shoulder rest and it, it becomes you know stretched at the moment that that's when it gets low. So watch out for that. Um, So um, listening to the instrument more when playing in the orchestra, so you move my ear to it as soon as, uh, as, as close as possible. Yes, that's what we do in the orchestra. And yet that's why we usually start losing some hearing in the left ear. I mean, all professional musicians, especially violinists, I don't know about the oldest as much, but it's possible. But violinists do, uh, in general, lose uh, hearing in the left ear. Not completely, but just some. Um, um, and yes, hearing the note, I completely agree with you. Hearing the note is very important when you play. Uh, but also, in for the orchestra playing, you absolutely must be able to place your, your fingers in the right places without hearing them as well, because sometimes it's impossible. Sometimes it's so loud out there. I mean, the brass is playing, the winds are playing. It's not possible to hear yourself, okay? So you for intonation, you absolutely have to know the placements of each note without hearing it as well. Okay, let's look for more. Oh no, that's, okay, all right. How to develop musicality? Uh, playing as an adult beginner is very unmusical. You know what, honestly, um, Every beginner, adult or not adult, is going to be unmusical for a long time, unfortunately. Why? Because technicality of playing violin is just so, just so difficult. Okay, so yeah, there's a lot of goals into just learning how to play with a straight bow, with all the basics, and then learning to uh, shade the sound, the tone, and then do crescendo, do diminuendo, it's just part of expression. Um, and then, of course, vibrato comes at some point, and that creates a huge difference also in terms of color um, and shading. So, yeah, developing the bow technique, being able to do diminuendo nicely, you know, to go through, I'm, I usually show like two favorite notes. I'm not sure if it's uh, audible over the computer, but I start with more sound. I do diminuendo to the middle of the bow and then crescendo again to the tip. So more sound. Diminuendo, crescendo. Then I start at, at sound with fourth. Diminuendo, 
crescendo. Okay, so those are like really, really basic things to learn. Uh, of course, the really basic thing is to do diminendo, just start stronger, do diminendo to the tip, start at the tip stronger, do diminendo to the frog. Those are basics and also quite hard for beginners. So to start here strong is not hard, right? And then we do diminuendo. And then we start here strong again with the help of the index finger. And then I do diminuendo here to the, what we call niente, nothing. Okay, and then meanwhile, staying on the string, I took the bow off because I'm speaking, but staying on the string, then continuing again, stopping the bow, starting louder and so forth. So technique, there's so much technique goes into uh, expression that unfortunately, yes, you have to learn that technique at first. Um, what rubber replacements for legs would you recommend? I, I would imagine those are uh, these legs, right? <laughs> um, the shoulder rest legs. You know, I honestly tell you, you, you buy what is out there. I don't know what's out there because I have these ones. You see, they're black. They are from my very original uh, Wolf Forte Secondo. And my very original Wolf Forte Secondo, I think I bought it. I'm afraid to tell you the date, uh, the, the, the year, but I think it was like 1995 when I bought that one, the first one. And since then, I keep those legs. So I change this portion when it wears out, but I move my legs. So they're quite beaten up everywhere. But those, these, the black ones, they last all this time. So they don't need to be changed. But later on, of course, they started doing them in such from such a rubber that needs to be changed so we can pay more money. So basically it's rubber tubing. If you can find it not for violin, it probably will be cheaper. And then you just cut the pieces and slide them onto the legs. Whatever rubber tubing is available. That would be my suggestion. Uh, yes, oh, Iran, my goodness gracious. I mean, you're still there, that's very late. By the way, I will have another stream uh, specifically geared towards people who are in the countries who cannot watch right now. I will have another stream that will be uh, my um, Saturday, July 30th. And for the other countries like Iran or India and, and so on, countries that are living ahead of United States, uh, it will be on Sunday morning, very early morning on Sunday, the 31st of July. So just in case it's helpful. Um, how to play crescendo or decrescendo without making a horrible noise? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's uh, a nice one. Yeah, I mean, really, you know how a violin is called uh, in Russian? It's called skripka. And skripka, it is the horrible noise that the door, unlubricated door, um, makes. Like screechka, it should be called in, in English. Screech. That's the sound that we make a lot when we first starting. So how to project <laughs> a horrible noise? It just tells me that you're a beginner. Well, I just have to make sure that you don't press too much like this. You just hold the bow above, try to play above the string. It's a good one. Try to play above the string. So I will be playing on A string, but in fact, I will just play on above the string. See, like this. Just a tiny bow like close to the frog. Just tiny, tiny, above the string. So if you can see here, well, if I touch it all, it will be that very faint sound that I don't even intend to do, let's say, right? I'm only just above the string. And then you will do the very same faint sound. It won't be very nice quality, but at least you will know how to control it. Um, so, and therefore, when you do decrescendo to the tip, it actually should be pretty fine as long as you don't start from that. So, you just allow the bow to play. No, don't press with anything. When you're going to the tip, let me see if I need to wait. Get up. You know, I just basically lift, can lift all the fingers here. And the sound is naturally really, really, really light at the tip. So that's how you do the simplest diminuendo to the tip. It should not be any problem if you don't press. 
at the frog. Okay. Um, some online shops will sell replacement rubber for the feet. I know Sharm is Oh, yes, you're, you're uh, thank you. They're responding to somebody else. Um, again, uh, left hand articulation when you're playing etudes with too much legato. Uh, okay, as I said before, all the articulation in the left hand is the speed of taking the fingers off. But if it helps you, let's say you, you play the etude that is written legato, but if you, you think it will be helpful to you, I don't know, I will go to Kreutzer number two, I guess, for lack of uh, thinking right now. Of course, Kreutzer number two is written in detaché, but you know, actually I would suggest to practice at legato too, uh, slurs. Let's say it was written that way, okay? So, and... Let's say it was written that way, and I would be worried about my articulation. I would do to detaché. I would go to detaché. You know, if it if it helps, if you know that your taking off became uh, faster, maybe it will be helpful. But I normally do it actually on legato and just watch that and hear that my uh, taking off is fast. Okay, uh, uh, rhythms really help with this, different rhythms. Not only the dotted rhythm, but uh, other rhythms as well. Okay, how do you choose a uniform position? Okay, let me see, okay. Uniform position or tilt for my left hand fingers on different strings and positions for intonation. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, um, this versus this. So for the fingers to feel the most comfortable, I make an adjust adjustment with the uh, with moving around here. Okay, so in other words, I do not uh, agree with some people who say we always have to f hold violin here on this bass joint. Uh, at, the, at the G string we do, but on E string, no, on a E string that for me at least, I have very long first finger and just basically long fingers. So for me, that doesn't work. I have to be lower here. And that's then my angle of my fingers will be maintained. So uh, I recommend to slide here, this part, just like the bow, you know, so that that's how I would uh, approach that. Uh, how to learn improve up down bow staccato? Uh, up down bow staccato is a basically martial stroke. And how to learn and improve it? Oh, there are two questions. I mean, there how to learn it. I have a video on explaining how you do it. And um, improve, it's a different story. Okay, so I think I will probably skip for right now because it's a very, very broad and very long question actually. I have to do it more in depth in a video, for instance. Um, um, a professional violinist plays mostly Baroque recently, raised my attention on having weakness in my left hand, third finger. Any, okay, left finger weakness. Um, you know, be careful with that. First of all, who told you that you have a weakness? What do they mean by weakness? Do you see? Do you hear that it somehow is compromised? It's not working very well, uh, or is it just somebody who observes how you play and it's more visual rather than sound-wise? Because if it's only visual, disregard that comment. If you hear in the sound that there are some problems, and you know what, I would probably recommend that you would maybe um, uh, write to me in an email because this is it may be a serious situation and I don't want to uh, make suggestions, you know, offhand suggestions. My email, I, be, I believe I post my uh, email now that I have an email, uh, violinclassusa at gmail.com and I, I believe I post it now after, under every latest video, violinclassusa at gmail.com. Um, how to improve my sight reading and how do I practice it? The second violin is a bass player. Um, I can know for my, how my part fits and the other parts. I really get lost. Um, okay, so improving sight reading is to do it every day. You, you set a time 
that you every day you will do five minutes if you are short on time five minutes at least of sight reading okay you cannot do less than five and you give yourself peace a piece just any kind of piece or whatever instruments you're playing in and uh you look at the time signature, you look at the um, key signatures, of course, you keep it in your head and then you start playing. Take the tempo, looking at the hardest spot on the page, take the tempo of this spot and keep in the same tempo and do the best you can. You cannot practice. You can only go through it. If you're completely lost, then you can just go over that part and and further on but you should not exceed five minutes a day or 10 minutes per, per day you could do if you side read several excerpts okay but not like working on an excerpt really particularly just fixing so you understand okay subdivision of the rhythm is very important um, usually in sight reading and we learn it with practice um, another part of this same question uh, how my part counter melody fits with the other parts this you need to practice not with your part and not start reading your one part, but actually looking at the score. Absolutely, you need to look at what other people are playing and how it fits. That's the only way you can learn. And uh, most people play uh, things, fortunately or unfortunately, that have been recorded before. Then, yes, you have a shortcut. You take your score. Score meaning maybe it's a piano reduction. It's good enough. Or maybe it's actual score if it's a the score is uh, available, if it's a concerto or symphony or whatever. So then you take an actual score and listen with the score and see what else is going on. Um, Adult years of playing have trouble vibrato, finger two on E string, hand too large, no room to vibrate, my hand is already touching the E peg. Okay, um, this peg, right? So uh, you are telling me that it will be like, on G, right? And then you'll feel like you're here already. Um, I The easiest thing to do, well, I mean, it should really, I mean, I have pretty long fingers. Um, usually the easiest thing to do first is to make sure that your peg is not in this position. You see how my peg is? It should really be then, um, well, none of my pegs right now are in like ultimately great position for me it's fine because i don't run into it my hand will never go that far in, actually even if i vibrate only if i vibrate on the f which probably would be close if i take f natural with my second finger which is not ever something we do then i probably will get what you're getting on g right and that's because my peg is not horizontal, uh, not vertical. I will make it vertical. Make sure that you restring your string and so that the peg eventually will come at a vertical thing. You will have a little bit more room. And then if you're still uh, doing it, then I would say, um, yeah, I hope that you have a regular size violin. Um, and then you will, you, you will have to use a more narrow motion of the hand. But yeah, the position of the peg is really important. I don't worry about position of my pegs because they are the magic pegs. So if you have a question about magic pegs, I can explain, but uh, it doesn't matter now in which position they are. But for, for with the regular pegs, the, it's very important that your position is um, not like this, not like horizontal, but more, and yeah, even, so turn that way, turn away from your hand more on E. And for the others, yeah, more like, well, actually for the other pegs, this position will probably be okay. Comfortable to tune, I mean. So it's a comfort of tuning versus comfort of playing, which are two different things. Should uh, we measure the distance between collarbone and the chin? Um, collarbone, chin, uh, well, you could measure, but I honestly don't know what it will. Well, I suppose it may be useful. But you know, I will go by feel, honestly. I, I would rather go by feel because still, you can have the same everything between people who have the same distance, you know, here, uh, but still, it will, it will feel different. Thick leather covers for and rest may be good. Um, since being a student, I have been focused on improving your pinky mate. You know, I don't know if you would neglect your third finger. It's one of the longest 
and strongest fingers, but it's possible. Um, it's maybe, but I'm worried to give you that kind of advice. As I said, I would rather attend to this more personally. Um, I work on being relaxed and keeping my hands flexible when playing excellent scale, but tense up almost inevitably when playing the pieces. Any advice on that? Absolutely. So basically what it means when you're playing exercises, you know that this is an exercise mode. And then you're like, okay, I'm only functioning with my technique, right? Then you go to peace and suddenly there is some kind of emotion is involved, some kind of feeling is involved and you forget about the movement and how you did the movement. You know what? You can approach in two ways. One is start making music on your exercises. You know, if I'm playing, like, I don't know what your example would be, but let's say I'm playing my shradic even, you know. Normally, this is just for the dexterity and lifting off and articulation exercises and speed also. But if I go fat when I go faster, I want to make sure that I'm not just training right now my crescendos. Like, you know, the, with the bow, that's a techni technique. I would feel it. Like, I want to express it. And therefore, I would do crescendo. You see, it's a difference. Not to do crescendo mechanically, but to do it from expression point. And then notice what else gets tense and then let it go and go to the ear, completely to the ear. Ear has to hear it as, as if you are really involved, but not your body. It's a confu confusion between what we hear and what we think we should feel while we are producing this uh, sound, which a lot of times you can do completely without tension. But that is a big, big uh, question, Evelina. Um, and I work with this with my students all the time on this thing. So another one is to integrate, to take a part of the piece in which you're playing and dissect it into small, small, small segment. And each segment first do with completely relaxed and then I call it infuse it with feeling little bit, little by little while remaining uh, as relaxed as necessary. Um, yeah, right thumb locks up. Well, right thumb is in, in, in your right hand, yes. So uh, again, it pr probably means that uh, your thumb kind of functions differently. Something is going on with your hand when you're playing a piece, something changes, so you need to catch what the change is, uh, probably video yourself in such a position when you can see uh, very well your hand and your arm, your bow arm, uh, close and far, and see what the difference is when you are in an exercise mode and when you are in a peace mode, uh, okay? And then in the peace, just go for necessary passage uh, with, with a feeling like you have it in the uh, in, in the exercises, absolutely. Does the pressure on the string have impact on the note? Uh, I mean, you reach your less, with less pressure on the strings with your fingers. Well, actually, yes, it does. Um, and usually you get more clarity when you press more and uh, more fuzzy fuzziness if you, or, or less clarity when you press rest. But let's not confuse the pressure. You know, I saw somewhere that you have to press, uh, I think it was in the Maya Bang or Maya Bang method, um, that you, you, you one should press it with excessive tension on the string, which is a horrible, horrible thing to do, actually, I would not. Even though the many other parts of the method of Maya Bang are quite good, quite good, but this one suggestion, I was thinking, oh no, please don't do, it. don't do this. So pressure has to be enough to depress the string fully to the, uh, to the fingerboard, but not press it into the fingerboard, okay? It won't help. But yes, if I am on, let's say, so that will be half pressure. Well, I mean, it actually will be like bad sound in this case, but if it's, that's three-fourth pressure. And I feel the string vibrating against my, my, my pad, or I go to full pressure. And I hope it's audible that that's uh, the clarity. It's, uh, it's clarity is there. Then I used to overpress to uh, to resonate that lowered the pitch. Uh, no, I don't think the um, 
over pressure will uh, lower the pitch. It's slight different difference in the position of the finger, which is a lot of times we don't even feel it. But if we look at it, like really look, oh, it it slightly is changing when we press more. It just will kind of go downward, so you can press more and don't don't overpress, but overpress up. That's a nice one. Um, how can I work to build endurance? Yeah, look, yeah, my first moment, Uh Yes, okay, there are two ways of, uh, two, two parts to this question, endurance. What types of endurance? Physical endurance, are you get really tired because you're just playing for so long, especially a cadenza to the end, right? Because that's when it goes like through without stopping. So when, it's uh, that section. If it's physical fatigue, uh, two issues. Maybe you're not doing a lot of car or a lot of uh, enough cardio uh, cardio exercises. Actually, you have to be in a good physical shape to do it. Uh, that's number one. Number two, it's most likely has to do with more tension than necessary. Which probably when you practice, you have less tension because you practice by little portions, hopefully. And then uh, monitoring the tension. And when you play through, you also have the weight on you. Oh my God, I'm playing it through it so long. And that kind of starts pressing on your mind and meanwhile start accumulating tension. That's all connected, right? Mind and body, very connected. So um, if that's the issue, then it's the issue of going, oh no, nothing is in the matter. I'm going just through this little passage here or this little spot that I practiced before. It's perfectly fine. And now I'm in this little spot and I'm practiced before again. And so you, you switch from spot to spot to spot to spot like this, rather than going, oh my God, I have so much to play. This is about overall tension, okay? Um, and then also there's mental endurance, which is you should be able to force to see the whole movement um, in, in your mind's eye like what's your uh, exposition and then development and then cadenza, which is the peak of the moment and going to uh, a recapitulation. You have to be able to go through it in your mind and maybe even with fingers in your mind with everything, uh, then you will build this up like this. And uh, lastly, once you learned or have done these things, um, is to play this movement in one day without like really run it with all the fatigue, hopefully it's not from tension. Okay, I just want to say it's it's not from terrible tension. If it really starts hurting, for God, for you know, God forbid, uh, that means there's too much tension that is just bad. Then you need to undo this problem first. But let's say that's not the case. It's more of a mental endurance. It's more of a stamina and so forth. So you did what I just told, and then um, you run this piece uh, in entirety. Uh, let's say at least five times in one day. Okay, no stopping. No matter what happens, you just go through and through and through how it will be on stage, and that usually up to ten times in one day, by the way. And that's usually just this gets you on a different level. Okay, um, how to deal with performance anxiety when performing a solo piece, and what are you thinking while performing and playing? What I'm thinking while performing and playing is hopefully exactly what I thought when I was practicing. Exactly that. What else you can think? Uh, if you, if you, if other thoughts, other thoughts come to your mind which you haven't practiced, then you are not recreating. I mean, performing is recreating our practice in front of other people. That's what we do. Practice, therefore, is performing what we always practice. How we will, we will performing, you know, in every shape of it. So, yes, that's what you do. So the question is, then, what do you do when you practice? Um, okay, and I think a one single... Okay, wait a second. Uh, where did it go? Is there one single thing you focus on while performing sound? With, oh, no, no, no. You focus on everything. You hear everything. Absolutely everything. And you monitor as you play, and you keep looking forward in your mental eye. Uh, yeah, mental eye constantly looks forward to next next spot, which you will be playing. Not even next spot, like next bar, next several bars, depending on how 
it works best for you. But no, you constantly monitor everything. That's a difficult part, of course. Again, we learn it when we practice. Uh, how do you develop the awareness of so many details such as this under pressure? Again, the under pressure is the key to the question, right? It's, it, it shows me that um, the, this person, but it's actually many people, you know, this is a very good question, excellent question, because so many people ask it. And I, of course, also as a younger player, I went through exactly the same worries, like how, oh, I mean, I would be performing and suddenly some other things will pop into my head, you know, like I would be thinking about suddenly, oh my gosh, uh, did I turn the light off before I left my apartment or my house, whichever, right? So if that happens when you're performing, it means that, well, it, it means that you're playing on automatic at that moment and we do not want to play on automatic ever. Automatic means on autopilot physically. We learned everything and our body is playing and our mind is traveling somewhere, you know, this is something we want to avoid all altogether. So uh, under pressure will not be there if you practice knowing that this is what you're going to be thinking. This is how you're going to be talking to yourself when you're performing. Exactly like that. Nothing will change. There will be no such thing. I mean, there is no such thing really. Oh, I learned everything and now I'm performing. No, it looks like that, but it's not, it's not how it works. You constantly work. There's no performing for you. It's, it's you're performing in, in the eyes of the audience. And for you, you're playing, you are doing your homework in front of other people. What maker is my violin? My violin the, is made by Carl Becker, 1920. Um, okay, one question, how do you teach your student to progressively control inertia, momentum and string crossings or bow changes? Um, that's a very deep question, actually. How to control inertia momentum? Well, it's mainly, I, if I understand the question, in string crossings or bow changes. Okay, we'll start with bow changes first, I think. Although string crossings too, I suppose. Okay, so we can go to string crossings. So. I'm not sure that I actually understand inertia momentum in string crossings you know have you seen my video on string crossings um i have a rather detailed video on three levels of the string i think that will be helpful i'm not thinking in those words usually myself inertia or momentum honestly i don't so therefore it's a bit hard to understand uh bow changes is a different story there there could be some momentum so if i'm playing at speed for instance And there, the speed kind of carries me through the bow change. Uh, but again, how to progressively control? I think it will be more about controlling the weight of the bow. That would be more for the frog and uncertain strings, and not so much about inertia or momentum. Sorry, I'm I'm very literal. So as you can see, I get with the words, and I want to be very precise of understanding the question. Um, is learning to play with a mute bad idea, a bad idea, worrying about how loud and clear we're stressing innocent bystanders? Well, I suppose if you only play for yourself, it really doesn't matter whether you play with a mute or not, but it will be, if you're not ever performing, never thinking of playing for others, you'll just learn that that's how it sounds with the mute. So, which is fine, I suppose. But you know, I've never dealt with a situation like this. I sometimes have my students um, travel or I travel and have to practice. And then you choose your battles, you know, you choose your, uh, where you're going to, whether you are going to be annoying to others. Uh, well, hopefully not because you will practice when they're not in the, in the rooms, in their respective hotel rooms. Oftentimes, I would be asked to put in a, hopefully, in a room that there are no, no neighbors, so I don't bother anybody if I practice a bit later, but not too late, of course, in hotel. In hotel. So in the hotel, yes, I would practice with the mute mostly. Um, but in real life, yeah, I need to hear my sound. I need to hear the response because it's different. Um, but again, if you always perform with me, play with the mute, why not? How many years of serious practice do you believe is needed to get a job in the orchestra? Ooh, what a loaded question. 
I can only answer this saying in general, in general, there are always exceptions to the rules. Um, but in general, for the position, again, it depends. So exceptions to the rules will be an immense talent of somebody. If there is an immense talent, which is all many, many, many things makes talent, right? So if there are well, probably at least 10, I would say, but that's, it's very short for like most people, 10 years probably wouldn't be enough. Yeah, it would be more than like 15, 20, but uh, it could be 10, but it could be even maybe, I don't know, maybe, I don't think I know anybody who had less than 10 years of serious professional practice and was extremely gifted who could do that. Um, how to plan effective practice, I have only one per day. Um, well, you want to basically have uh, your general technique that you want to practice every day. Um, intermediate or beginner, by the way, or or not, or professional, uh, you want to have um, some technique in that hour. You want to have some um, perhaps etude. Etudes are so technique means scales and or exercises, either scales or exercises, you can com combine them. Uh, you can uh, uh, do one today, for instance, I will do scales and tomorrow I will do exercises, specific exercises for the left hand, let's say. Um, or if you can do a little bit of scales, a little bit of the exercises every day, it depends on how, what works the best for you. So next will be an etude. An etude usually combines maybe two, three techniques in there, easier to manage than the piece. And then you go to the repertoire, to the piece or pieces. But in this case, I probably would imagine you work on this on one bigger piece or maybe a couple smaller pieces. Don't work on too many, too much repertoire. Better finish and then go to the next one and finish, go to the next one, rather than they have a lot in at work and play it for a very long period of time because you'll get bored and then it goes, the effectiveness goes down. Uh, so, but yes, it would be um, important to kind of portion out that you have enough time to, uh, to go for the important issues that you have. Maybe you have more bow problems than the left hand problems. Then I will make sure that I have, you know, 10, 15 minutes just on the bow today, but it doesn't mean like this for the rest of your life. It can be until you fix it, because the main thing is to, in one hour, to get the goals, to reach your goals, okay, right, of course. Um, and then you can change uh, change the pattern once you reach those goals. How you improve double stop vibrato um, is to um, go by the finger that vibrates better. For instance, if your third finger is vibrates better than the first. Like, let's say my first doesn't want to vibrate. Like I'm trying to do vibrato, right? But I don't have it. And my third meanwhile vibrates fine. So I will not press a roll here and let it like basically slide like that. Of course, it's an awful sound right now, but I'm just feeling like, oh, it can move along the string. Then I will press a little bit more, but I will go by the third finger and allow them both eventually to not uh, interfere with the movement of the wrist. Pretty much that's what it is. Okay, um, uh, let me see. Okay, next, I can't play the fourth finger in the right place. How can I improve and know the right position? That is unfortunately a very general question. Uh, I cannot tell you in the right place, which right place. I, it's a bit, a bit too vague, but I suggest that, oh, you know, if necessary, <laughs> obviously, again, it's a beginner. So you go, so your fourth finger doesn't want to go that far or it doesn't want to go like where? Does I want to go or so it goes flat, then I will move it with my right hand. I'll move it and keep it there like this and feel how I will remember it. I think if that if I understand the question correctly, that that's a good way to do it. I actually did it when I was very little practicing, yeah. Um 
uh, is Sarah Violin. Four months ago, find it very difficult to bow evenly on two strings. Absolutely, it is very normal. I wouldn't, four months ago, evenly on two strings. You mean like to play double stop? Well, you shouldn't be playing any double stops if you're only playing four months. No, just play one string for probably a year. Then go to double stops. Okay, maybe at least at least seven, eight months just on one string, on each string, and you know, all strings, but one at a time, not both. Yeah, it's it is very hard and don't go there yet. Okay, so um let me see. Um I think I'm missing some. Oh, let me see again here. So <sighs> Okay, vibrato, okay. Uh, so vibrato above or below the pitch? Uh, vibrato goes both uh, below and above the pitch. There have been several studies on that already, uh, dismantling the idea that we uh, always vibrate only below pitch to the pitch. Um, I will post, I, I, I'll think about how I will do this to post this, the studies that I read. There's actually three studies that I read. There's a fourth one, which I can't find right now again, but I did read it. Um, and you know what? The thing about that vibrato going always lower to the pitch is a completely American idea somehow in my perception. It is something that I only heard in the United States. I've never heard it growing up in Russia, um, never heard it from those people who I knew in Europe never heard that. We always were uh, told that vibrato goes evenly about the pitch. You know, some people vibrate a little bit more below, some people a little bit more above, but uh, basically just around the pitch is here and then you go like this, okay? So the more narrow your vibrato, the more it will be close to the pitch. So if you constantly go below the pitch, it will be flat in my opinion. And so luckily these uh, studies that were done with machines, just machines, impersonal machines, registering the uh, vibrations, they indicate that yes, indeed, who, no matter how people learn, if they think they vibrate below the pitch, they still will go both ways. So. Okay, so what uh, your suggestion for late start? Uh, there are talents who only encounter the right method and teacher to consider the road and the just foundations should be built up. Yeah, you know, I, I'm dealing with the same uh, too, with the same uh, stuff uh, sometimes. Um, improvisation of the methods will be good here. So I usually, yeah, I usually fill some gaps, but you can't fill them all in the conservatory or, um, or, uh, or university, let's say. So, being creative teacher and not, but not allowing these people, uh, not going like, okay, everybody's playing Mendelssohn concerto, so you should be playing Mendelssohn no matter what. Of course, not like this, right? So we have to fill the gaps because again, if they're very talented, you already, they've gotten some strength somehow. If they got them without etudes, that's fine. They don't have to do the etudes to get the principles of good playing. I knew as several people, who've, uh, I, it's a horrible thing to say, but it's true. I've knew several wonderful violinists who never did any etudes or any uh, exercise work at all. They just only practiced pieces all their life for, with their teachers. They were taught like that. And um, usually all of them at some point had to work uh, to, to come and rethink some of their technique. It's true. But they could achieve great heights if they have great talents. They can achieve great heights by just learning a repertoire. And I'm pretty sure that some people can just learn on repertoire. Why we even learn on etudes or exercises and then etudes and then uh, in re repertoire? It's because we have to process things, and usually most of us, we have to process in small portions, you see? But if these people are able to do this on pieces, then good for them. The only problem that usually happens is that they get tense. So they go for the sound so much for how it, the, the ultimate result, they get tense. And a lot of times these wonderful players, very talented, they start developing or have developed already tension and you know it's not good. And that's when I will go back, I will lower the level of whatever they're playing and I will go and find out exactly what is the problem, basic 
you know, usually gap in something basic. And I will retrain that gap and then we'll go back a little bit, a little bit slower in terms of repertoire acquisition. But yeah, that's what I do. Would you mind discussing how tilt and if there are any changes of your right hand while tilting the ball from a flat toe tilted position? Oh, to a tilted position. Um, yeah, I, um, myself, let me, let me get some water. So I play with a tilt all the time, uh, pretty much. I, uh, but I can see, I mean, there, there, is, there are many people who will start with a tilt and then go to flat here in, at, at the tip. Um, I suppose it's fine. I mean, I don't play like that. I actually maintain the tilt even in here, but less of it at the tip and more, perhaps a little bit more at the frog. So that's how I was taught. Um, bow tilt and e, but you know, there's a school like uh, in New York. I know lots of people who just play in flat hair. I mean, they start with flat hair and they have completely different feel here. And, you know, they do get more sound, but it's also, in my opinion, it's about more, it's bigger sound, but maybe it lacks some shading a lot of times. Uh, it lacks a refinement, but, you know, it gains in projection. Um, going from this position, I change this position here. So this is a tilt versus no tilt. It's mostly like it's a turn of the thumb. But will I really do it when I play? Like when I'm playing at the speed? No. Absolutely not. So my, I, if I need to triple forte and I'm at the tilt, I would actually just depress the bow into the string and it will go to flat hair. But the stick will be slightly tilted anyway. You see what I mean? So, but the hair will become flat just because there's more leaning into the into the string. Um, you started practicing uh, in the park near your house, sitting up away from people. Yeah. That is a good thing. Uh, what to do to develop third finger strength? Um, I would say playing to do to develop. Yeah, okay, so it's the same thing. Um, it's the same like what you did to develop the second finger strength, I would say, or a fourth, which is playing uh, exercises, but not, not overplaying them only, you know. <laughs> I mean, I don't quite understand what the strength is. It's like you feel that your finger doesn't depress the string to the fingerboard. Um, I'm not sure because if the other fingers do and the third one doesn't, and you do exactly the same thing as you do with the other fingers, I think you actually might benefit of asking, a, honestly, physical therapist. Because sometimes there is something wrong with it well, I mean, not wrong, but some tiny portions of muscle fibers are undeveloped uh, by birth, from birth. I had actually a couple of students who had this situation, not with a four necessarily. Yeah, actually one was a third finger. It wasn't about the strength though, uh, as it turned out. It was about the strength of certain muscle fibers that were not working. And no matter what we did on violin, nothing worked. So. If your other fingers, uh, second, for instance, functions well and your third doesn't, I would probably actually arrange for a consultation to see that you don't have any uh, real uh, you know, problem away from the violin. But uh, it also, yeah, so that would be number one. But other than that, I cannot, I, I just don't get it what, I mean, we should not be banging into the violin at all. We shouldn't be. We should uh, usually when you practice uh, anything with a third, it won't be open string to the third, right? It will be mostly like you have a finger already on, on the string and then the third comes out. So the other finger is pressing at that moment somewhat. And the third one, so it doesn't really need to press so much. So I don't really, for the third finger string, I don't really understand it, uh, how it could be unless there's some kind of, a, you know, problem in the muscle itself. The park idea, what violin sound characters are ideal for leaners, learners? Bright violin. Um, if you're a beginner, just go with the violin that you can afford. It really doesn't matter. I mean, you have to develop your ear to hear the sound. 
I mean, I, I could never choose when I was a little, like, what kind of violin? I mean, whatever violin they gave me, I had to play on it. And tell you, I wasn't very good violin either. But, but you make sure that that not so good violin sounds really good. Then you learn, then you grow, then you get a better violin, the one that you really like, for instance. It, it's not, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, so again, I guess uh, the same person is asking me many, many times, so I will see the question, what to do to develop further finger strength. Again, if you have a really, really big problem, please write to my email, maybe we'll figure out what your, what your problem really is. Um, okay, so now, how can one improve dexterity, especially with the third and fourth? Okay, third and fourth, um, one practice, should one practice la fast passage and how to stay loose? <sighs> you practice in small portions. On those slow, small portions, you do rhythms. You know, for instance, if I, I don't know if I have a fast passage and I notice that my fingers are going, like they fall like this, let's say, right? And I need, I need articulation or you know back end. So what I would do that is your generic uh, dotted rhythm. Then you reverse it. You know. So you always have to do both sides of that one. If you uh, then other rhythms come in in, in pass. You know, so that these rhythms, they, um, I, I, be, I believe I have a video with these rhythms already. Um, so again, look it up on my channel, actually. And uh, you vary them. For instance, if you need tatam, param, when you practice short notes, these are the ones that are like in fast tempo. So your brain rests on the one that on the ones that are slower and focuses, focuses, focuses on the ones that are faster. Okay, so that's why the rhythms are good. It's not just like okay, practice the rhythms and by themselves it will by itself it just improves it. No, it's how you think. You think in pulses. Da 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 da. Relax. Da da ba 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 da ba 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 da ba ba. But when I do this ba da, it doesn't mean get tense. No. It just means focus in my mind. So, and with this, the movement has to be articulate. And again, so it's not like this. Not a slow movement like that. It's deliberate. Every finger. So the fingers have to go back enough that they can... They have some distance to fall onto the fingerboard. I hope that will answer your question. And yeah, practice uh, Shradik and Shevchik are uh, great things. Just don't over practice. Again, don't over practice too much at uh, the same setting, at uh, the same uh, several minutes at a time. When I practice, I hear my neighbors to, oh, nice, listen to this. Yeah, mm -hmm. so some people like it, some people hate it. So. What do you think of competitions? Um, there now, oh my God, don't even get me started on competitions. What do you think of them? Nuisance. They're a nuisance. And you know what? The, the, the most of them actually are just absolutely useless. They don't do anything. They don't promote people's careers. They don't promote even the sense of well-being because there's so many of them, as you write. Absolutely. So I just it, but people are going now for making art as a sport which is wrong really uh, so those few competitions that were before okay those uh, created visibility to those amazing people that would play in them but right now all kinds of people play all, all kinds of tiny bitty itty bitty competitions especially the kids the beginners oh well, let me play in this competition why it's totally useless i didn't play a single competition before i don't know I never played the competition before I went to conservatory at all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so fine. Do you have some tips for someone preparing to auditions in orchestra? 
in orchestra. Oh, in, in the orchestra, yes. I mean, well, you have to play very well, first of all, just like play very well, and you play very well your excerpts, like you play your caprices, your etudes. Um, and then you definitely need to arrange your excerpts in a book. So not like, okay, you know, so you will know, open, like you have one symphony, another symphony, third symphony, no. You make xerxes of each excerpt and you put them in the book, like a binder is great. And then you practice with that binder, you know, so you're fast in terms of switching from one excerpt to another. And then also practice the excerpts in different order because you don't know how you'll be asked them. Um, knowing the tempo very well, uh, rehearsing the tempo many times, switches of tempo, ch changing, uh, checking with a metronome, playing for other people, absolutely performing for other people, performing for peers, hopefully. Um, orchestra. So again, professor, sorry, I'm, Okay, how should we practice shift going down on scales? My thing is four, four, three, two, one, three, two, one. And I find out being inconsistent in intonation for shifting down. You know, it depends where. Uh, a lot of times in this, I mean, are you talking about four octave scales? Are you talking about three octave scales? It's all different questions. So if you have three octave scale, I don't know, I will go for G probably, right? <laughs> You probably are talking then about a higher scale than G, right? So if I'm one D major, and that is my note in question, so then I have to see like what 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 the problem I have with it. Do I over over uh, shoot? You know, I go too flat. Um, I reduce the motion then. Uh, if, if I go usually sharp, then I will increase a little bit of my motion. But main thing here to, to remember here is how your fingers pretty much meet like this. So you go on the first, and then it's like they're almost like this in the air. So that way to think, it's going to be much easier, I think, to control where your landing is. Yeah. So, um, can I ask her what is a resonant sound? I hear about it a lot, but still don't know how to produce it. I hear resonance. Honestly, those are words that I, I, I don't know what they mean. Uh, not, not your words. I know that somebody says these words. Um, they're very general words. Um, resonant because you may be pressing too hard. Then one has to press less, play with, with more speed. Resonant because your intonation is off, uh, because when we're playing like notes that have open strings in common, like they all have corresponding open strings, they have to ring. So if the note is out of tune, it will not ring, and therefore it will not be very resonant. Like note of C or Do, here we call it in solfege. It has no resonance in itself, so nothing will vibrate, no strings will vibrate with that. But uh, of course, it can sound like this is because I press too much, or I'm I'm in the wrong contact point, and I'm also pressing too much for that for that contact point. You see what I mean? So resonance is a very general word. I would be word. I would be careful with that. Uh, next question, uh, Professor. I have triangular hands. With very short thumb and pinky. Hmm. You know, yeah, we have all kinds of uh, variations in our hands. So if your thumb is short and your pinky is short, that must be difficult. Well, you have to find out the way to cope, honestly. Your thumb probably, maybe sometimes, I, I mean, I have to actually, honestly, I have to see you in order to be professionally giving professional advice. My thumb is very long, and therefore it's going to be higher up here. Uh, yours will be probably here by itself but your hand will not be as, as that much down. And then for short pinky, you have to turn your hand more here, you see? That's what short pinky will necessitate. But again, I probably would really, depending on how professional you are, um, if you're professional, then um, 
then it's one story. If you're not a professional violinist, you will need to uh, refinger things. So you will use one more one, two, three, rather than turn your hand so much to your arm twist. It's really not good for the ulna nerve to over twist the hand towards the, uh, towards the neck. Um, but we have to do it. We have to turn it somewhat, of course, to play with the fourth finger. But if your fourth is too short, then you, you have to make adjustments. Um, if competitions are unfair to a great violinist, Sienkiewicz, Markov, Korsakov, are they unhealthy for students? Well, I mean, I, violinists like Sienkiewicz, Markov, or Korsakov, they could do anything. I mean, so they played competitions and won them, if I'm not mistaken. Um, are they unhealthy for students? It's, um, is it unfair to compare which was, you know, the whole thing of a competition, as I said before, it's really, it's, it's like a, it's making an art into a sport. So some people, I mean, a lot of people enjoy sports, right? Why? Because you can judge like, oh, this one is better than the other one. But you know, when somebody will listen to, uh, I don't know, will listen to Markov and judge him for themselves much more, much closer to their heart than let's say Korsakov or, or another way around. I'm just, I mean, only go by the words that you use, by the names I have absolutely, I think all of these violinists are just tremendous, tremendous. Um, and Sitkovetsky, I knew, I, I'm, I hope that you talk about the Julian Sitkovetsky, Julian Sitkovetsky, like the, the father also, not, be, not because the son is not good, he's excellent, but I was called, you know, the greatest uh, violinist of that time. One of the greatest was Julian Sitkovetsky. Um, and of course, Markov is Corsico. They're phenomenal. But, you know, maybe you find that this one is more appealing to you in some pieces and maybe this one in some other pieces. And But meanwhile, how do you judge them in competition? Like, it's, it's kind of stupid, really. But that's what people like doing. Most people, I don't like it doing it. I don't care for competitions. A lot of times I would hear, if I do hear a competition, I would, for instance, uh, like somebody who doesn't get the first prize, but I like that person better. I will go to their recital rather than to the winner's recital sometimes. And sometimes the winner is fantastic and I will go to his recital or her recital, you know. So it's it's just, yeah, it's two things uh, being compared, which in my opinion, they shouldn't be really compared. Any thoughts how violin playing has developed over time? The Russian school service occurred. Oh, that's a huge question. You know what? I probably will have to make a video on that one. I cannot go into this right now. Uh, yeah, I do have some ideas about how it developed. Sorry, it's just, it's too huge. It's just too huge. Um, um, is it okay to have two hand positions? Two hand positions? mainly use a high thumb position, but when I want to reserve it. Of course, oh, of course, absolutely. You can have many hand positions actually. Once, okay, so all right. once I said it, then of course I open a can of worms. I should be careful about who we are talking, like for what purposes different hand positions. When we go into virtuosic realm or when we go into the vibrato, vibrato is a very different technique than for instance, dexterity. You know, so when I play fast, my thumb will be in a certain place, you know, the, the optimal place for me, you know, will be there, right? So, but when I do vibrato, a lot of times, I'll, my thumb will go under the violin almost, or even behind there that way. But I would never play my passages anymore. I used to when I was younger with my thumb, you know, being there. But uh, I don't anymore because it is physiologically not good. And now I have the backup of uh, physical therapists and hand, uh, hand uh, doctors who tell me why this position is not good physiologically. So we know for sure, but if for, you know, the thumb backward. But if it's for vibrato purposes, it's a completely different thing. Main thing is that you have this part open, you know, that here, they, it doesn't press together, it doesn't clash to come together. So if that happens and your thumb is even back and you don't, and you manage not to reduce uh, this space, you can play like that with a thumb, and then you can move it. Look at it's Huck Perlman's playing. I mean, he's all over. His thumb is all over the place. It sometimes feels like, looks like it has a life of its own. Is that uh, mainstream for everybody? No, I wouldn't recommend it mainstream because he's playing without shoulder rest, with a little bit of pad, but still it's a different technique. 
and therefore in that in that technique the thumb will be even more mobile and changing places and also you have to have that type of hand to do what he does right so it's it's very individual but of course we we change uh, all kinds of uh, so that's why we always say thumb should be flexible. It should be able to move. Why? Because it has to adjust a lot of times, but not in one, uh, not in one uniform passage though. With that we don't want to be doing any kind of adjustment movements. Okay. Um, any thoughts on how people practice worked in in the past and today? Oh, you know what? I would wish I would go into the past uh, and see how they practiced. Well, I mean, I can kind of surmise how they did, but again, I probably won't take time right now. It's a big topic, it's a big topic. Now let, let's see, I'm skipping somehow. When I go here, I just skip. Um, working on fixing my right uh, hand, arm, and we'll have some tips when I bow. I play with my elbow hanging below my wrist. I work on it straight. And from wrist to elbow to upper arm. Uh, okay, it, it really depends. If you are at the frog and you have a little bit of wrist elevation, for most people, it's fine. I play like that. There are some people who play with flat wrist all the time. If you play with flat wrist, in my opinion, you have to raise the elbow somewhat, but of course not like this. So I don't play, I can't play with flat wrist for different reasons, but I play with my wrist slightly elevated at the frog. So it will be straight, become straight as I draw the bow down and then it will become more um, you know is it con concave right uh, when I go here and then it returns to this so it there's not much of motion change between this is frog this is middle this is tip you know but pretty much that's what it is so uh, watch where your the elbow should not well the elbow will hang if your wrist is here if you're at the frog but if you're are here and your elbow is hanging, you need to bring up your elbow. Um, okay. When I press the string and the sound, it's very awkward. Though my hands are back. So, so I don't know what happens with my left hand, but when I press the string, the sound is very awkward. And the, unfortunately, I can't tell you. It's a question that I, I need to see you. I need to see and hear you. I don't know what happens. What are your thoughts on proper violin concerto technique-wise? Uh, it's a very hard concerto. There are lots and lots and lots of techniques involved. It's not an easy concerto by any means. Before pro playing Prokofiev number two, you should play, I don't know, probably a lot of them. You have should play, you should have played, right? You probably did. Um, Vietnam, at least a couple of Vietnam concerti and, uh, you know, Pagani, get to Paganini Caprices, play Paganini Caprices before you play Prokofiev, in my opinion. So there are just lots of stuff in, there is a lot of stuff. And also it depends which movement you're talking about. But yeah, I would say many people play too early, especially like you start first movement, play first movement too early. Yeah. By the way, what are the magic bags? Okay, magic bags are called magic bags. They are on the market. So basically they are tuners. So they are placed into the peg holes here by a luthier. I wouldn't do it myself. Uh, so, but there, I mean, he can retract them without damage to the peg box at all. So that's that type of the pegs. And then they are pretty much fine tuners. So uh, if I, I really don't need to do this. This is my habit, you know, like tuning like this, but it's a, uh, to tune because there's a mechanism inside of them that actually works um, as gears, little gears in there. So it's great. I mean, they've been used for a long, long time by bassists and uh, then cellists and uh, finally they got to us. And I've had this for many years by now and many of my students switch to them. Oh my goodness, I will never go back to regular pegs. Absolutely, because there's no such thing as a peg slipping or the string slipping or whatever. It's just, it's great. It is magic, so I agree, magic. Um, to a good uh, professional luthier is uh, how well the instrument players, absolutely golden words. If you have a good instrument and you're a good player, the, the, the better you are and the better instrument you have, well, actually, I should re retract that. 
any instrument will sound better if you take it to a good luthier. It's if it's set up correctly, uh, but if it will be more noticeable for those people who are professional or pre-professional at least, good players. Where, uh, when you place your index finger on the D string, does it touch the A string? Can you please explain a little bit finger placement on D string? Um, so when I place like this, no, it doesn't. So to check that, you, you play double uh, a, a fourth. So if it somehow touches, like there will be no sound. So in order to do this, you, I mean, sometimes it can touch. Yeah, you know what? Sometimes it's fine. When I know that I'm not going to play a double stop, right now I'm there, yes, it touches. So that's fine. But if, if I need to go away and allow it to... Uh, to to uh, allow the A string to be there, I slightly change the uh, angle of the finger. So, but but yeah, for like passage playing, when you don't have that, absolutely it can touch. Let's see next one. Okay, since the pieces are more important than native exercise in devolving, playing skills that mean should be practiced in the beginning of the practice and then potentially. Practice over this. No, not devolving. You mean evolving playing skills. No, I didn't say that since pieces are more important. I didn't say that. I said that um, at least you know, in my opinion, what matters is that you one gets good results um, on whatever we play. So most people work much better from in technique from simpler to more involved, from simpler to harder. Absolutely majority of people will work that way. The pieces are usually the hardest because they're more complex, most complex. And uh, therefore, yeah, I would actually recommend to go from smaller uh, goals, which is usually exercises and etudes, second, uh, second stage, so exercises or scales, and then etudes, and then pieces. But, you know, when you practice uh, every day, then it doesn't, it, it's not important to completely always go in this progression. I would change it sometimes. Um, if you are comfortable with starting with a piece because you're warmed up and your brain is working, uh, how it should be working already, like the brain is warmed up, not only your hands, then you can start with a piece, of course, in your practice, if you like. Uh, but I would still do the other stuff as well. So, um, yeah, I would do all three. But the order, I think, is more to offset the boredom and uh, the variation so you can be more flexible. Um, should four of the scales be done in all keys, like Kogan said? It, no. <laughs> four of the scales cannot be done in all keys. They are possible to do. I mean, Kogan never said that. Kogan couldn't say that. <laughs> No, I mean, you do four octave scales on G, A flat, or G sharp, uh, A, um, B flat, B, and maybe C. And that's it. And then you never go, I mean, you should, I mean, unless you're playing cadenza by sore, then okay, then you can do D also, fine, because there's one passage that there, like, you know, starts in here, in the middle, in the middle here, that D is D scale. As far as I know, only in that cadenza. Uh, but other than that, no, it's not possible to do all of them. Um, is it going to help us improve faster to spend two hours? Or as Kogan said, half of our time to scales and natives and rest in pieces. You know, I have come to the mind that a lot of uh, traditional, and it was very traditional still, to spend as much time as um, I go less by time rather than by what you achieve. Um, but yes, probably. I mean, it, it does help one violin at least. Uh, not just scales, scales and arpeggios. Um, it does help because then to do more of them, and and then you play your pieces. But I would not recommend any specific time regimen, because like for instance, for uh, some people, for me when I was younger, if I played too many scales, like scale, 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 I will start having some uh, issues with like. 
not maybe problem, but yeah, I would get tired. I would get fatigued. I mean, I'm using the same muscles all the time, you know? So no, it wasn't for some people. It's not that way. And for some people it is. And by the way, Kogan did have problems with, uh, um, with being tense, unfortunately, not because he plays a lot of skills, I'm sure, but still, um, Complete beginner again after many years. Okay, by having not no having a resonance, they mean you hear it loud. The feedback of the string is over loud, so you never make the string vibrate enough. Yeah, well, I mean that means too much pressure. So for that reason, um, for that reason, pressure bow pressure should be adjusted, of course, more speed rather than pressure. Uh, I see. A green never the most yeah. It's about competition. Oh, Delaine, hello. How do you recommend to keep your brain ahead of your fingers to stay coordinated when working on a piece? Uh, think ahead. That's exactly how to keep uh, to keep uh, ahead of your fingers. Well, you know, remember what's next. And if it doesn't want to do it, then you talk to yourself out loud. Like you just tell, now shift, now back, or thumb or whatever that might be a problem in the next uh, passage that's that's how you do it you actually yes you talking is good talking while you're playing is very good um fixing um excessive pressure let me see um on the index finger of the right hand uh fixing excessive pressure on the right index of graphic. Okay, so first of all, you know, playing at having a student or yourself playing at the at the frog without it all together. Not of course going here, but at the frog. So learning how to play without it all together in the part of the bow that will sound by itself, and then um, and then going for more speed rather than pressure, even in sound. Let let the sound be lighter. So. Again, I'm just keeping my uh, in this completely off. So usually this pressure comes because people over pronate. And so to be able to change the uh, angle of your hand and concentrate more on the like being in the middle of your hand in terms of its position, I believe it's very helpful. Um, and so just for helpful layers, develop a brother that starts in the beginning. Oh, yes. Yes, I have suggestions to that. <laughs> okay, so start in the beginning of uh, the note. It's a it's a huge problem right now. Yes, people are just okay. How do you get it to move? Oh, I got it to move. Um, beginning of the note. Yeah, it's just well. First of all, the ear has to get it that it doesn't start in the beginning because most people don't notice that they do. You know things like that or the even like this, you know, delay. They just don't even hear it. If you don't hear it, you can't fix it, right? So uh, it's possible to start beforehand, you know, like, uh, and then make sure that when, uh, usually people start beforehand and then they do this, and then they stop at the moment the bow touches, right? So to touch or have the bow on the string already and then start, Start with rather and then immediately start the bow. It, it, it helped, has helped to some of my students anyway. Uh, in terms of um, uh, continuous vibrato, uh, the best, of course, a well known example uh, exercises are to uh, lower finger and then raise it, lower, raise it while this finger keeps vibrating, you know, like, or like the wrist keeps vibrating. It's not the finger that's vibrating, but the, the wrist, right? So lowering the finger on the string and then raising or lowering this one and then raising. That's the main one. So after this is done, after the hand doesn't react to verticality of another finger, it, it, it the problem is solved. Um, first time I heard momentum was a minute and six lessons. I mean, I've been playing separate string crossings of the bow. Yeah, it. I see. Yeah, not not to not to work too hard. Okay, I get it now. Yeah, so it's more. Yeah, I I can understand what it means. Um, uh, 
um, I probably should reread the six lessons again and see how I can use it with my terminology. You know, I, I just don't right now use that with the word momentum there. Um, I probably would use it a bit. But letting the bow do part of the job, absolutely. A lot of times, you know, it will be in here, realizing that you're not going to be landing on the same part of the bow, actually, that you, the distance between the strings is there to help you in a way. Um, and yes, some movements becoming more passive. I would, you know what, for me, I would say don't work so hard. And a lot of times I'll just do the trick. Um, how realistic it is to be a self-taught violinist? Not very realistic. I mean, it's just darn difficult instrument without outside ear, outside eye, outside ear. Once you've reached a certain level, then yes, then you can be self-taught on violin. Not from the beginning, though. I don't think so. I've never, I've never met one. Um, I mean, I've never met a successful self-taught violinist, a good self-taught violinist. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so hard time. Let me see. Again, I moved so some things in this. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm shifting. Okay, I. Uh, oh, yeah. Three note, okay, three note chords, yes, three note chords in bar for voicing. Play three note chords since rolling them isn't most appropriate. I think it wasn't that also a question that I had before. And there was a question not from the chat, but from, but before. And I will see here. Um, Putting three fingers or three or four fingers at the same same time while playing chords is that that question also? Uh, do we put all four fingers or three fingers uh, with double stops? Of course we do, but what about three on four note stops? And also another kind of idea related to bit. What about the fast speed of bow? Is it correlated with the pressure? And then this question is how we practice the C-note chords. Well, I guess it's different. So to practice C-note chords, um, for intonation, I will break them. Let me see. Um, sorry, my bow got loose. So. You know, like that I will do for intonation so I can hear two and two, meaning two lower strings, two upper strings, two lower strings, so double stop, double stop, double stop. that's for left hand. For the right hand, it's also not bad, and I do as it comes, uh, because I'm relaxed here. I'm not going to try to get like three strings together. Um, and then when the speed, uh, uh, when I increase the speed, it's easier, much easier to produce three notes uh, together, right? Uh, so I would be closer to the, obviously, to the fingerboard. And to the question of putting several fingers together, yeah. So a lot of chords, three note chords, are actually only two fingers are involved because they're fifths. We don't like fifths too much, but they're there a lot of times. So if it's a fifth... So there are only really two fingers involved, but the three notes. And so those we have to, of course, play together. And then there's this, uh, that chord together. Yes, this one, it happens fast so that we have to be able to place these three notes down also together. So I probably won't practice like that, honestly, just lifting and spot tapping up. On the other hand, maybe I would. <laughs> if I, I try it and I feel like, oh, it's useful, I'll do it several times. Uh, but usually from so that accord before, you know, and then you go to that one. Okay, so that's for putting the fingers together. Now, I think your question was how to three note chords for box in terms of voicing. Well, in this particular example, the voicing, of course, is not an issue because all three voices are moving. Well, I mean, the middle voice is not moving, but the, the outer voices are moving, so that would be fine like this. Um, 
again, depends on how more Baroque you want to be. People who play more Baroque, they will also roll these chords too. Taryam, 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 and like just like that. They're not going to play them as three notes. So they will be more like this. Um, so depends on the chord, I think, or situation with the chords. Yeah, but I first will just practice for good left hand placement and then decide how I want to do voicing, which way. Should try to be practiced with a drone is in the in the appropriate key to help intonation. I never ever in my life practiced with a drone, so I would not recommend the dancing. Unless, again, I mean, if you're a complete beginner, if you're an adult, and now they, they, these days they have good um, tuning, I don't know, but to what drone will you put the shradic? That's my question. So if it's A major and there's a drone on A, then your C sharp will be constantly flat. It will be like that, and that would be wrong. So. So your A, your D will be fine. Your E will be fine to the A drone, but uh, the C, C sharp should will be flat if it really matches the drone. So if you know that and you can adjust that C sharp will not match the drone, then it's sure, of course, because you will have, and B also will be eh, not anywhere. So A, D, and E, you will get in tune. That you can do if you exclude E, B, and C sharp from, from trying to match them because it will not work. Um, what is correct hand motion when changing bow? How to make the bow change smoother? Depends on where the bow change. I mean, I would imagine you probably, I mean, I use it at the frog. Well, at the frog, I'm, I'm doing the, you know, what, you know, what, what I explain in, I, I do explain that in the bow hand uh, bits and pieces, bow hand part one, part two, part three in there and also i think i have a video on bow hand uh, i know i do <laughs> more in the basics so i would just suggest that you watch it um i think i'm saying everything in there how to change it smoother and so on how would you practice passages from like a dis descending double stop chromatic passages in the supposed to get the condenser mm, descending double stop chromatic passages Oh, you mean those? That one? Because I, the bow moving. Oh, I mean, if that's this one, there's no like accuracy of the left hand. So you just basically do vibrato movement. And then you see that it's pretty much like, uh, sounds like a chromatic scale. But it's not literally da, 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 like this. No, if that's the question, because I think that's the only one. Uh, so it is uh, just it's a kind of virtuosic thing. Like you know, Vinyavsky used the same thing in the Vinyavsky concerto, da, 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 you know, like in the, um, at the end of the first moment. I'm having a hard time on that vibrato. I feel like I'm not working, especially on the pinky finger. Yeah, well the. Fing, pinky finger is um, usually just because in our head somewhere there's a lock saying, oh, I'm, I'm a little bit more like this and therefore this movement cannot be there. So maybe you should practice here, vibrato, feeling like all fingers, let them slide like this and the fourth as well. And then you can do the same thing here. So like, so somewhere there, your fingers will be on all strings and then just feel how they slide all of them and so then just slide and like allow yourself that sound and then slide and then slightly more pressure on the fourth it, you know um learning playing pieces you're conscious of the theory in the writing like this is a measure for the dominant seven chord moving or does it just sound right practicing? I, I would use theory, of course, because you want to memorize it, you want to know. I mean, it, it is useful, yes. Oops, again, it skipped a lot somewhere. Why are conservative systems nowadays so bad? <laughs> nowadays, on the top 1% soloists are not even close to the level 56s. And it is, is it partly because teachers spend more time with students? more time with students back then. You know, I'm not sure that I completely agree with this um, 
with this statement, honestly. I, I uh, It's hard to tell, okay? I, I know that you're a professional violinist and all that, but uh, there shouldn't be a system in conservatory uh, anyway. I mean, it should be one one to one, and maybe that's the problem. Um, and uh, sorry, I just have to keep up the, the time. And then um, the top one percent soloists. Okay, soloists. I guess that's the question. Well, that's a question about individuality. It's not about the conservatory systems. It's about individuality. We've stepped away from individuality and we went to con conform, conform, conformism, conformity, I think. I think that's the issue, not the system. So out, it should not be the system, it should be individual. Um, uh, YouTube, um, yes, so, but now I know that she was subscribed to Violin Lab. If somebody did well, it's wonderful. Um, what should, which should the price relation be between my bow and my violin? Oh, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one. I'm depending. I mean, you have to have, if you're a professional, if you're going towards professional, if you're semi-professional, then I would say, I think the bow is a little bit more important than violin because I can play with a better bow, much better on a worse violin than I can play with a, in an excellent violin with a very bad bow. But the price relationship, I mean, they're really different. So the violin of certain level would be, let's say, $5,000, right? And then the bow of that level for the bow probably will be 700 much cheaper. Um, but I cannot give you, unfortunately, I cannot give you, uh, like, examples of $1,000 violin versus which dollars bow. Because it's just, I, I'm dealing with professional level, at least, or pre-professional, professional level. So there's, yeah. So do you, da, da, da. anyway, in Sotie, um, I think I'm kind of sh uh, covering that Sotie in one of my latest videos, maybe, I hope. Um, and uh, the bow should bounce the same exactly way. It's the left hand speed. If you have no problem doing two notes, uh, two bows per note in Sotie. If you have no problem doing it, and then you cannot do it when notes change, it means your left hand is be behind your bow. So you need to speed up with the left hand on the um, on, on the bow uh, on on the passage in legato. Okay, I think actually I need to well be, I need to start wrapping up. Oh my goodness, it's already. Uh, oh, thank you so much. Привет из Москвы. I need to wrap up. Also, I do need to answer a couple of questions uh, from before because, I mean, the people who put them here before we wrap up. Um, let me see. If you have only uh, 30 to 60 minutes to practice, you're professional in the orchestra. Um, how to keep your shape up? I would say play Paganini Caprices. Uh, or, or play Bagani Caprice in some piece that you really love, a difficult piece, and you alternate that days, one day, the other day, and then third day you can just do like a hard scale with um, double stops in double stops. Do tens, uh, especially finger ductives. Do finger ductives. Really great stuff. Um, will help. Um, I guess. Don't do Bagani Caprices, definitely. Um, string crossings, I think it's fine. And then the slowest or fastest speeds of vibrato that are musically useful, you know? Okay, so somebody uh, was writing this comment and says um, six, eight notes per, per whatever beat. I would say go for three notes, uh, three uh, count of three, wah, 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 rather than wah, 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 because it's, it's, you have to subdivide, and this is the is, uh, subdivision is the fastest in three rather than six. So I would suggest going in three, eight notes, not six, as, a, as I said, and um, the good vibrato will start, like the possible vibrato between 104 per three, per three, 100, 408 to 120. So 120 and maybe a little bit above. 
Okay, and do I whether I have workshop for mature players and beginning intermediates? I haven't, but maybe I can think about this. Okay, I there are several more questions. Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Arsenti, for helping me a lot. Uh, write your questions here, and I will address them in the extreme session. So yes, I will address these questions first that will appear in this chat. And then I will go to questions that will appear during the next stream. Uh, as I said, also information about this next stream will be posted. Okay. Um, thank you all. It was very nice to be here with you. And until later, bye-bye. <laughs>